Hello and welcome to Director's Cut. I'm Spencer Fowler. And I'm Ryan Davies. And we are so excited to be back in our virtual form so we can interact with our many fans on Facebook and Instagram. Spencer, I don't know about you, but I'm loving the commute from bed to desk because last week I, or last show I almost was late, but I don't know about you. I would definitely have to agree. You know, only having to worry about my top half was much better than worrying about, you know, an entire outfit. Don't worry, I, I am I am wearing a complete outfit, but you know, the top half is most important. I was just about to check to confirm that you were in fact wearing pants. So I'm at ease. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I'm really excited to be back here. Definitely last show, you know, you were here with me, Ryan. And you haven't experienced being online yet, but it's so great to interact with everyone on the various social media platforms that we're live on right now. I'm excited. I'm already see I'm already seeing people in the comments. I agree. Look at all those people. Amazing. Spencer, how has your semester been going as we're wrapping up? This is our last show of the semester. How's it been going so far? You know, I would have to say my semester has been fantastic. Honestly, I think it's kind of exceeded my expectations that I kind of had going in. Um, you know, being back in person has been absolutely fantastic. I think that my professors have been really great and overall understanding, you know, of the situation. And I think that everybody's kind of on board. Everybody, everybody was ready for this. Everybody kind of knew what they were signing up for. And so, you know, I, from my peers to my professors, it's just been absolutely fantastic. What about you? I, I mean, I'd have to agree just as far as, you know, being in person, the fact that we could be in person, being film in your case and TV in my case majors, it's so crucial to both of our majors that we are able to do things in person. And I've just been really impressed with the way we've managed to adjust and in terms of, I, I personally work at the equipment room and the protocols that we've implemented of quarantining equipment and everything. I've just been really proud. There's Julia Davey, one of my lovely coworkers at the equipment room who can attest to the, the chaos, but also the joy of also just figuring out how we do it. and then adjusting like film and TV students always have to. Yeah, I know. And I think that's something that's so great about being here is that we are with everyone. You know, we're moving with everyone. We're moving kind of with the industry and learning how to, you know, overcome these challenges and how to take them on. And I really think it will be quite beneficial for us in the future. I know right now it's a little bit difficult, but I think in the long term, we'll have more of an understanding of, you know, how to get over these really difficult times. And yeah, it's also crucial to mention that all the struggles that we're having at college are also the struggles that the industry is having. I'm personally in a writer's room, TV writer's room class, and that's through Zoom, which is not unlike the majority of TV shows and um, production offices that are currently working and operating right now. They're all through Zoom. So we're adjusting and any of the struggles that we're having. Justin, I'm very chill. Much, <laughs> thank you very much for asking. Are you, are you chill or chilled? Right now. Well, you see, Justin's referring to um, he's referring to Advanced German, uh, one of the other productions we were doing here at Hofstra, and um, how I played a character who had to be chill, and there was much fervor over finding me a Hawaiian shirt, and ultimately Justin was kind enough to lend me a Hawaiian shirt, not only for that scene, but for another shoot, he also lent, lent me a full suit. So Thank Justin's been providing a lot of my wardrobe, but I assure you this shirt is my own. And so with the German, um, what was that show called really quick? Advanced German. Advanced German. Do you actually speak German in it? Not that I know of, but they might be dubbing me in post. I'm not sure. Whoa. That's actually pretty interesting. But I think now, actually, we're going to take a look at one of the packages that our Director's Cut package team has produced called Nightmare at 20,000, 20K Hertz, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's check it out. What you are seeing is a young man, Trevor Johnson, nearly an adult, in his last year for a Bachelor of Arts degree in television production. He is best at his audio production and recording capabilities, so this session normally goes easily. All right, Jamie, we're going to start whenever you're ready. What he does not know is that the moon has shifted the time from a typical day to one in the dark room.
Uh, let's, let's try that again, Jamie. Is there anything in there that you can wave around? Yeah, let me use this here right here. Okay, let's, let's try it. Uh, all right, let's move on to the shopping scene, uh, Jamie. Can you grab those items in the bag and just move them around, I guess? Did you just see that weird monster thing? No. Do you want to take a second? No. 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 I guess I'm seeing things. You want to you wanna go again? Sure. Get out of the booth! Dude, we need to get out. Not until this monster is dead. What monster? The monster that was in there with you. There was nothing in there with me. Let's go. That certainly was something. <laughs> it's you know, it's funny, Spencer. We saw these packages yesterday when we were rehearsing, and my audio was a little screwed up, so there was a jump scare that I didn't quite get. But my audio was quite loud, and that jump scare really got me. So props to our package team for. Yeah, same here. You know, really got me, and I might say that was possibly my favorite um, clip so far that we've seen from our packages. I know they got more coming, but also to, we're going to throw it right now to Ways Like You, a clip from Jack Dalrymple's film. What do you feel now? I feel you.
Well, Jack, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, that was a great clip, I must say. When did you uh, make it? What was what class was that for? This was for my 47, um, almost two years ago, which is crazy to think about. Um, time is flying by, even though it feels like it's not moving at all. So yeah, for sure. And so, given that, that given that, given that, excuse me, given that that was two years ago, and you're rolling into your senior year, what was your biggest takeaway from um, ways like you that you're bringing into your final semester here at Hofstra? My biggest takeaway was uh, being proud of a film while also being able to look back on it and learn from my mistakes. I think that was my favorite uh, part of the whole film as a whole. Um, the whole film as a whole. That was my favorite part of the film. But to look back at the other scenes and say, mm, I could have fixed this, could have fixed that. I think as uncomfortable as it is to admit your mistakes, you learn that way. Um, you know, if I looked back at my 47 in my senior year and said, yep, it was perfect. Don't need to change a thing. I don't really know how much growth I would have really, you know, had. So. Yeah. And that growth is just so important. It's such an incredible feeling, I'm sure, you know, to kind of have that realization that now, you know, you kind of feel, I guess you might say leagues ahead of where you were then. What are some sort of focuses that you've put into your films now that you didn't put into, um, ways like you? Uh, now I'm much more conscious of, conscious of, you know, pacing, timing. Uh, thank you, Justin. <laughs> Big plant vibes. Um, oh, always, Gally. Yeah, I'm just more conscious of taking the time on set to make sure my film will look the way I want it to look. Um, once I'm in the editing room, as you saw, with this 47, there wasn't much dialogue. We weren't given that much to uh, say. So I really had to communicate a lot through color. Obviously the whole thing was saturated in pink, which to me kind of symbolized a lot for the film. Um, so I would definitely say that taking the time on set is one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. And that leads me into, I was actually just about to ask you about the saturation of the color there. That obviously was a very clear artistic choice on your part. What were you um, really trying to symbolize with that? What was the artistic intention behind that decision? So with the uh, lack of dialogue, these two characters, I think I was limited to something under 10 lines or maybe even five. I had to show how these two obviously fall in love um, after this kind of dance that they had throughout the whole short and um, this kind of oversaturation of pink which to me i was choosing to you know use as a metaphor for love for finally feeling accepted for finally feeling um, like you found your person i wanted it to be in every way just overbearing um while at the same time it's such a beautiful scene in my opinion and i think at that final moment when they share a kiss we don't even need to see it, I think it's more beautiful that I can cut away and let the two of them just have that moment together. Wow, I I love that. That is that is so great. What are some other inspirations that you had, um, you know, in the creation of this film? I definitely wanted to highlight uh, queer identity. That was something I've always kind of wanted to put into a project. Um, and I just thought that my 47 was the perfect opportunity to go about that. And I just thought, you know, why not? and it was super great. The actresses were phenomenal and uh, they were really um, accepting of my directing style. And really it was just, it's such a fond memory. When I look back, the only thing I can really be uh, upset with and not even upset with is just the mistakes that I made back then and now know not to do again. So really my 47 as a whole was something where I just look back and smile. So if you could give advice to someone who maybe now is taking 47 or taking it next semester in terms of where they can go, because, you know, 47, from my understanding, being a TV major, which might be a little flawed, 47, you know, it's after 27, it's before your big senior film. So I kind of noticed that it tends to be people's kind of middle ground where they're really establishing themselves. What advice would you give to someone who's about to take that journey with 47 next semester? <laughs> Thank you, Callie. Uh, good font is always a great uh, choice, but I would definitely say take your time on set and don't let you know a skeleton crew scare you. Um, my crew was very, very small. I was my own DP. Uh, my friend Maddie, she was also part of the crew and acted in the short as well. 
Um, skeleton crews are often very intimidating, but had my crew been extremely large for my 47, now that I'm a senior in a pandemic, I would be a little intimidated, but because I had a skeleton crew and now that we're seniors, I have to have a skeleton crew for this year. So really it prepared me in a way that I wasn't expecting, but with there being a small amount of people on set, take a deep breath, take your time, iron out all of the, the bumps and it'll be okay. And if anything, you can always fix it in post. <laughs> <laughs> That's always such a great saying, fix it in post, you know, mm -hmm. that's always, mm. um, but how is your senior going this year? Are you doing a senior production? Yes. Yeah, so I'm in a senior film with a lot of TV and film students that I'm sure we all know, and it's going pretty well. We've just uh, closed out our round of first drafts and now we're in um, second drafts. I just had mine the other day. What kind of candle is it? It's a peck sniffs. I got it at home goods. <laughs> um, but we just had our second draft and I'm gonna go make some more revisions later. And then once we get back from next semester, we're really gonna start, you know, seeing our films come to life slowly but surely. It's very intimidating and it's daunting for any film student here at school. You know, you get here freshman year and they say, Hey, in four years you gotta do that really big important thing and you look around and now it's time to do that really big important thing. So you just want it to be good and um, with enough time and acceptance of fear, hopefully it will. Well, yeah. thank you so much for being here. We will, we will leave you now so you can get back to preparing that senior film. We're so excited yeah. to see it. <laughs> thank you Thanks so for much here. for having me, you guys. And now we are going to watch our next, uh, what do you call it? And Lauren Cohen's speech. short Guardian Angel, and we will be talking to Lauren after this clip. So. Wait, wait, wait. No, I think no. it's actually the grips are due on set. Oh, I was misinformed. I apologize. Jane and John just got their first job this month, their excited grips. Everything is about to change for them, however, as a suspicious force plays against them. He's gonna kill us. What the heck is that? Hopefully an asteroid to kill us all. Uh, I mean, the airport's like 20 minutes away. It's probably a plane, really. That's the loudest plane I've ever heard. I'll tell you what it is. It's aliens. Aliens? Really? Yeah, I've seen them. You've seen them? Well, I haven't seen them, but I've heard them. It's right here. You can pick up all sorts of frequencies and sounds. Sounds that they don't want you to hear. Yo, can we let him, can we let him talk his crazy blabber to himself, please? Like, I can't be late again. Did... Honestly, I just hope they started setting up already. <sighs> well, everyone's gone. Uh, are we early or something? Did everyone die? Uh, hold on, let me, um, let me take a call sheet. I mean, don't bother. The call sheet is right. You're the first group to show up all day. Art was supposed to be here an hour ago. The director is supposed to show up before me. Do you know what this means? Uh, I mean, we just saw the sound guy outside. Maybe he knows what's up. Uh, fine, I'll take anything I can get. Locked. Weird. I should have a key though. Hold on. That was open when I got here. Right? Here we go. Okay, let's try. What? It's not working. That janitor gave me the wrong key. Son of a. So you're telling me we're all in here by ourselves? Okay, guys, guys, listen up. Let's not panic. Yes, we are trapped, but we could go start setting up at least. So you actually want to set up? Look, John, there's nothing to shoot now, but we'll be shooting eventually. So I would just like to be prepared for when everyone actually gets here. I can't be mad at that. It'll be the first time we haven't been waiting on lights. Cute. I love, I love that package. I do too. I'm such, a, I'm such a fan of Sam Detweiler's acting. I know she was, I know she was a reluctant star, but I, I thought she did an amazing job. Also, we have to give a shout out to OB too. 
Oh, when, oh, when I saw gosh. OB, I just smiled because he just kind of he's always around and he just shows up at the right time and always. I talks. also think that he delivers one of the best lines. It'll be the first time we haven't waited for lights, which if you've ever been on a film set, typically a majority of the time is spent on fixing the lights. Of course. And television so, is usually audio. You never you need, but you know, always different. It always differs varying on production. That is definitely Part two is coming for Justin Moore. But <laughs> as there, since we're rolling into uh, Thanksgiving, or we've just rolled out of Halloween, what are some of your favorite holiday films? Yeah. Hmm. Well, first, I'd like to begin with Halloween, since we just passed that. Um, but actually, I think we should clarify, when we're talking about Halloween, does the film have to take place during Halloween, or can it just be a spooky movie? I think it can just be a spooky movie, but you know, if if it's a spooky movie that takes place on Halloween, all the better. Mm -hmm. Okay, then mine would probably have to be actually a um, series, and that would be Paranormal Activity. I absolutely love those movies. They were my first introduction to horror films. Um, prior to Paranormal Activity three, I don't believe I was ever afraid um, due to a movie. But after I saw Paranormal Activity three, I could not sleep. It was at a sleepover. It was a it was a big mistake allowing twelve year olds to watch an R rated horror film. I was about I to say, that. were you at an age appropriate time to be watching horror movies? <laughs> I feel like most people's horror movie introductions, I feel like they never come at the appropriate age, and I feel like that's what makes them so memorable to everyone. Yeah, I definitely have to agree. And what about you, Ryan? What's what's one of your favorite, you know, scary Halloween movies? I mean, it sounds I, I to not be incredibly cliche, but John Carpenter's ho movie Halloween. I was oh. I, I wasn't even watching it this this season, surprisingly. But I just I heard the theme. It was on a video or as a TikTok or something, and I just heard that score, and I just took my took was taken back to watching it. I think I watched it when I was like 15, 16, because I Scream was like my first big horror movie, and there's of course a ton of references to Halloween in that. So I finally like sat down and watched it but i just from an independent film standpoint from a you know just from a scary movie standpoint it's a classic and i love it but thanksgiving i feel like thanksgiving we might be able to gloss over because i can't actually think of any thanksgiving movies favorite time travel movie that isn't back to the future Ooh, ooh, uh, ooh. Ben Kessler. is it chronicle chronicle is pretty good i wait is it chronicle do they time travel in chronicle no chronicles where he is like the superhero you know, I thought they went. I thought they went back in time and won like a lottery or something like that. I, think I don't know. I somebody, would... somebody in the. Can we comments. get a fact check on that? Maybe. Yeah, Justin. somebody, <laughs> somebody check that out. If if I'm right, then that's it. If not, that's a tough one. I guess actually, would you would you count um, Infinity War as a time travel movie? I yeah. I mean, I think you have to. I think that's the only movie that really instantly comes to mind oh and let's see Nightmare is for christmas halloween or a christmas movie or neither i see this has been a debate that i remember having with a couple of friends in middle school who were big tim burton fans and i feel like tim burton or henry selnick commented and said that it was a christmas movie but i mean i feel like thank you i think i got it i got yeah it. i think it's a christmas movie as well because you know um is it is it jack skellington Yes, correct that is, that is he he learns the spirit of christmas and i think that is what is most essential to a a christmas film is kind of that spirit of sort of family i must say for myself my favorite christmas film is oh my gosh how am i forgetting right now with the jimmy stewart to you if you forgot uh, i okay i must say i just watched it for the first time this past year it's the one with jimmy stewart it's a wonderful, wonderful life. life. Fantastic. I also just watched that for the first time this Christmas. Did you watch it color or not? Black and white, of course, you have to. You see, I made a mistake and I accidentally watched it in color. Okay, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? What do you think? Yes, of course, Die Hard's a Christmas movie. It takes place primarily on Christmas. The whole the whole arc of um, John McClane's story is that he's trying to reunite with his estranged wife on Christmas and then you know, he does it but again. Don't spoil it. Don't spoil Dude, I, I didn't, I didn't see what happened. I said, I, that's, that's what he's trying to do. I haven't seen it yet. I've been trying to convince my family You've to never watch seen it. it. See, this this never brings seen up another topic. Is it really a spoiler if the movie is over 20 years old? Because I think at this point, if you're a junior, senior film student, you can't really be mad if people are spoiling movies that are over 20 years old. Listen, I will tell you, I have yet to have um, 
that film with Jim Carrey. I don't know why I'm spacing. I'm such a bad film <laughs> student right now. Oh my gosh. Oh, Eternal Sunshine. Um, as far as mine. Yes, that has yet to be spoiled for me. So I must say, you can pull it off. You can pull that it movie's off. so like vague and stuff. I wouldn't even know how I'd be able to spoil it just because there's so many <laughs> different ways that movie actually goes. But a great film nonetheless. Lindsay Knight, you should also check out Die Hard. Great. I love Jack's um, common favorite Western being Holes. That is great. I've never, I've never watched Holes thinking of it as a Western film before. But you know, I'll have to check it out again. I don't think I've actually fully watched. Like I, Holes was a movie. I think people. Oh, there's my mom. Wow! Hi, mom. Look at that. See, I told her, I told her not to comment anything embarrassing because the people who were monitoring the chat would most definitely put it on the air. And that was, of course, my first mistake. So you see, I think my I think my mom is somewhere out here in the chat, but I don't think she's gonna post anything. Fingers crossed. Fingers well, crossed. Answers, mom, if you're here, we'd love to hear from you. But first, we're gonna actually uh, take a look at a film from our next guest, Lauren Cohen's film Guardian Angel. So let's take a look. Well, Lauren, that was fantastic. I must say, it was a 27, right? Yeah, it was my final for my 27 film. Yeah, and that was so unbelievably powerful. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm amazed, you know, working with kind of the constraints that you had. Um, what, what were they just for the viewers so they kind of have an understanding? Um, honestly, when I was in 27, the only rules were basically just have it in black and white and there'd be absolutely no sound. And I kind of felt like, based on a personal experience, this would be the best way for me to go about doing it. Gotcha. Yeah. And so what um, was the primary inspiration for the actual story of your film there? We saw the, en the ending of it, which clearly, there's a lot to unpack there, a lot of it very powerful, clearly very emotional thing. What was the main inspiration for you there? Um, so not to get like too deep, but basically the main um, inspiration for it was a personal uh, paranormal experience I had when I was a little younger, where I was kind of not feeling the great that great mentally, and I felt this presence, which I've come to terms with the fact that it was most likely my grandmother who had passed away, and it was her saying that you're going to be okay and that you should continue on. Yeah, and that that definitely comes across in the film. It, it's. It's the most powerful 27 I personally have ever seen. You know, that was that was great. Fantastic visual storytelling. Um, Thank you. Did what what were your um did you have a crew or was it kind of a one person show? Um, 
I mean, I I had somewhat of a crew. And by that, I mean, I had my brother basically just helping me with lights, um, but he didn't exactly understand all the equipment. So I had to kind of teach him a little bit, but for the most part, it was just me doing everything. And so how has um, that experience on your 27 film informed things you've done moving forward? I know you were also the writer and director on that first package that we saw this evening. Yes. So well done on that once again. Thank but you. What, what was the biggest um, lesson you took from that film that's propelled you as you've continued on? Um, I guess the biggest uh, lesson I've learned would be um, primarily about how important um, like the camera work is. Like I'm primarily a person who likes to do things that are more pre-pro, like pre-production, like writing. So actually being behind the camera, learning things that happened during the production, it was so, it, it just taught me a lot about how to actually go about it and how the movement of a camera, the way that you actually angle it and all these different things, especially most importantly, lighting, how that's all very important in a film. And I'm definitely going to be using that once I shoot my 47. Oh, you haven't even shot your 47 yet. I will be this weekend. And oh, wow. so what, what, um, what year are you in? I'm a junior. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when did you take 27? A year ago. A year ago. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing. Had you had any prior experience with the camera, um, shooting films, or was this your first kind of uh, to, be <laughs> to be completely honest, I hadn't had much experience prior to this. Um, I had been doing a little bit of film work since I was like a little younger with my brother and like helping him do like those like stupid YouTube videos when YouTube was first a thing. But the main thing I used to use was a flip camera. So this is the first time I was using something that was like big boy hours type thing. I, I deeply, deeply miss my flip camera. I don't know where it went, but I'm sure it was yeah, lost many, many moons ago. But so um, roll, we're continuing off of what we were talking about earlier, what are some of your um, favorite holiday films? Just because I know there was a very contentious debates going on in the chat. And I'd love to get your take, Lauren. Yeah. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not a big fan of holiday films purely because I feel like as a person who celebrated Hanukkah, there aren't many out there. So I will say that one of my favorite films, even though it's a little not the best, is Eight Crazy Nights because it is one of those Hanukkah films. And, you know, I kind of like that Adam Sandler comedy in it. Mm, well, and now we have to get what your favorite Airbud movie is because our audience desperately wants to know. I'm I'm gonna start some I'm gonna start some drama here. I've never actually seen any of them. Oh my goodness! I know Whoa. I'm 20 years old. I haven't seen any. How oh many Airbud movies are there? Now that I'm trying to think about it, <laughs> are, we are we counting? Are we counting? Obviously, we have to count the Santa Buddies, the spinoffs with Air Bud's children. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I like Space Buddies a lot. I I was a Snow Buddies. I think I, I Snow Buddies was the one that I going back to our holiday theme. I was I was a big Snow Buddies guy. But of course, the yeah. first is a classic. Sorry, and so so Lauren, you know, you're kind of you know beginning to learn all of these cinematic skills. I guess you might say. Um, but you're also kind of teaching your brother. So did that kind of help to cement your knowledge or how do you think that sort of um, helped you? Um, I guess the way it helped me was that it started showing me that I knew more than I thought I did. And on top of that, not only was I teaching my brother, but I was also learning new things while I was teaching him all these different like equipment and like how to actually go about using it. So it was sort of a double learning experience because I was only teaching him what I knew, but on top of that, I was learning more with it. And I think those are always the best experiences where you learn as you go, as you create things. It's the, it's kind of the most amazing feeling of being on a set and figuring it out. But yeah. Lauren, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for getting in on the Airbud debate. I know it'll probably <laughs> be continuing in the comments for the rest of the show. Yeah, probably. Thank you. thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, now, we're going to the next package and the conclusion to the package we just had, which was grips called to set.
or something of that nature. We're about, we're so about to see the satisfying conclusion. Let's take a look. Striking. Hmm. Weird. Give me a sec. Okay. Maybe. Striking. No lights? Wow. Great. What a fantastic day. What the heck is causing all of this? It's the aliens. Aliens? There's no such thing as aliens. And you know exactly who would say that? An alien in disguise, an infiltrator. And the light just turned back on. Explain that. I don't know. I've just been sitting here writing my schedule. Nah, uh-uh, uh-uh, that don't make no sense. You were here first and didn't do a thing when nobody else showed up? You've been here waiting for us, haven't you? This is ridiculous. I'm Seriously, I'm on your guys' side. Sure, and that's exactly why you hung around here and waited for us to show up. Nah, grab him! And, uh, that didn't really accomplish much. I don't understand what's going on. Was, um, was, was he not? Uh, I can't, I can't take it. I can't even take it. Mm -hmm. What the heck? What is happening? Now? Why does that light keep going on and off? It's, it's you. It's John. It's your fault. That you were the one that wanted to set up the light, I so this was your plan this whole time. I wouldn't be here unless you gave me. These humans will keep sabotaging and blaming one another as they destroy film sets across the world. When they are desperate and afraid, they can do anything to each other. Chaos is not the lack of order, but merely its disruption. When people encounter that which goes against the norm, they may be liable to acts of delirium. This behavior reaches far beyond that of the dark room. I cannot believe they just went and killed OB like that with no, not even so much as hesitation. There was none of it. Ugh. Listen, I must say Miguel's acting. The light just turned on. That was so good. Oh my gosh. I, I love those packages, right? I, I don't know. I don't know how many packages you have seen from director's cut, but those were top of the line. I, I've seen quite a few and I would have to agree. And I would have to agree with that comment. Mom, can you pick me up? I'm scared. Yeah, I was I was a little scared too, but I also was laughing because I know everybody in the packages. Yeah, I, but, I, I was appreciating that. Having seen having been on some stressful TV productions with Sam Detweiler, I can see her getting kind of stressed with, with those lights not working. And I mean, I'm not saying she'd resort to violence, but you never know. Yeah, you. I mean, if film sets, TV sets, they can get pretty, pretty crazy sometimes. But you know what? I would love to know what you think of new movies going to streaming services right now. I think that's one of the most, I mean, obviously it's one of the hottest topics in terms of the film industry right now. I just last night or two nights ago, my roommates were actually watching The Witches, which was originally supposed to be a, a theatrical release from Robert Zemeckis, but it went to HBO Max. I can't say I was watching it, but I heard a lot of the sound effects and they did keep me up late at night. But I think in terms of, I think this is an evolving conversation that we're going to continue to have with um, what films are right for, what films can be released on streaming and still be shown in a way that's artistically true to the film versus films that 
should only be in theaters. And I think, I don't know if you saw recently the notes about James Bond and how Apple was in a, in a discussion to potentially buy the film and stream it on Apple TV plus it ultimately did not go down that way. But Spencer, I mean, do you think there are certain films that should only be released in theaters or do you think it's an evolving thing? Yeah. You see kind of being a lover of the cinema, you know, I think there's nothing more spectacular than, you know, going to the movie theater, sitting down, even alone um, and eating popcorn and just looking up at the silver screen, watching a projection, the colors, uh, you you almost can't match them at home the sound you almost can't match it and you know right now i kind of have to put that aside and go well i'm just a movie lover in general you know i love the cinema i love the experience but what's safest for me and what i find to be the best for myself right now is to not go to the theater Unless if maybe I'm renting out the entire auditorium for a screening, but to rent out an auditorium. Planning on doing that anytime soon? Because I'd I'd be super down. I'll sit in the I'll sit in the back, wear my mask, but I too miss the movie theater. Yeah, I miss it so much. And um, you know, to kind of answer your question a little bit, I definitely think there are some movies that are meant to be seen in the cinema. There are definitely some movies that you know are uh, benefit from being shown on such a large screen, which with such amazing sound. Um, But, you know, it's kind of, do you want movies? Do you want to appreciate movies and see movies all the time? Or do you want to have them in a specific setting? You know, what do you think? I mean, I think films that are being held up right now, like Wonder Woman and Black Widow specifically, I think those are films that 100% you have to see in theaters. It needs to be that community experience. You want a big bucket of popcorn. You want people cheering when the bad guy gets killed or thrown off the plane. Mm-hmm. But I think, I think with smaller films, and I think this is this is something that was happening even pre-pandemic, we're seeing that those modest budget um, indie dramas, indie comedies, they're not bringing in the people into the theaters the way they used to because there are so many options on streaming so i think all right so ben comes with us with the question are you for or against films like the new james bond going straight to streaming services is there going to be a snowball effect in the industry um do you want to take that first i think what we were just saying i think i mean i think it was already starting to happen pre-pandemic and now this is just COVID has been more of an accelerant less than an agent of change it's really just kind of sped up what we already were seeing and so i wouldn't I'd say I should be against it, but I think it's definitely something that we need to keep an eye on. But he's also wondering, films that wait for a theatrical release actually lose money in the long run? Spencer, what do you think? It's such a tightrope. You know, it's such a, you know, you're just foot, one foot at a time, you know, trying to get across. I think that's what um, studios and producers and distributors are doing right now. Um, In the long run, I see us going... 100% 100% back to the cinema. People love the cinema. People have always loved the cinema. And I think we will we will be back there when it is safe. And I think it will be, you know, um, it'll be up to the audiences on when they, you know, kind of decide that. Um, but I think we will be back and running uh, when, when it's, you know, when people are ready, I guess. You I say. think we'll be back. But I think the biggest thing based on everything I've read is the biggest hit these studios have taken is there are a lot of studios that had already started the marketing campaigns for their films. Oh. And that, well, I don't know. I, at last time I checked, Wonder Woman had moved, I think, four times. And I think right now it's slated to come out on Christmas. But I mean, with the rates we're seeing of things spiking, I'm I'm anticipating that move, that release date getting moved again. Yeah. And I'll, I'll come back to this Cali question really quick. But I, I want to continue with this conversation for just a second longer. Um, uh, I think I, I immediately think to James Bond because I think about how last November, uh, even maybe a little bit later, maybe in December, they released the Bond song. They released Billie Eilish's um, great song. song. Yeah, great song. But now it's been out. Now it's kind of lost, it been lost from the limelight of when it first came out. So, you know, when people see it in the cinema, are they going to go, oh my gosh, it's that Billie Eilish song? You know, I, I don't, I don't know. It's, definitely difficult. I think about Tenet 2 where they went January 19th. Okay, January 29th. Okay, August 1st. Okay, August, you know, and kept going and going and going. Um, But I also think about um, the film Freaky. Do you know the film Freaky? I do not. 
Um, it's a new one coming out by Blumhouse uh, with Catherine Newton, Vince Vaughn, um, the same director as Happy Death Day, Happy Death Day. Oh, yeah. Yes, I just, sorry, I didn't know Yep. And it, it looks absolutely fantastic. Um, but the only thing is, is that they are not doing a video on demand option, uh, which I think might have to do with the deal. I think AMC and Universal had created early on. Um, I think it might have to do with that. But I think that Freaky is one of those films that will unfortunately suffer from going straight to the movie theater because it is in that perfect market of 18 to 24. That's who they're trying to appeal to. And I think 18 to 24 um, year old people aren't really looking to go to the cinema right now. And going back to Kaylee's theater question, oh, there she is. Uh, my personal best theater experience, I would, I'm not going to say Endgame, unfortunately. Kaylee is on, actually, a little bit of trivia. Kaylee is on the other side of my wall right here, so I'm sure she's going to have something to say to me once we get off this. My personal favorite uh, theater experience was seeing Insidious Chapter 2. I saw it opening day. It was in ninth grade. I'd actually, I had lied to my friends and said I'd seen the first one so I could go to the theater with them. And so I went home from school. I rented it on demand, and I watched it that day. And it was a packed theater. It was just one of those experiences where everyone was there. See, everyone's just all about Endgame, so I don't even know. <laughs> those experiences I'm not with Endgame. There. They were thrilled, and I just remember a character that had been that came back when you thought they had been gone, and the audience applauded, and it was just. Mm. It was. A I must, what about you? I must say, I remember my Insidious Chapter Two experience as well. Um, so Sorry, I the end game people. We're just going to talk about Insidious Chapter Two. Yeah, I was uh, End Game. Yes, it was an experience, not my favorite experience. But Insidious Chapter Two, I remember going to see it. It wasn't my favorite experience either. But I'll get to my favorite experience. But um, with Insidious Chapter Two, I just remember they didn't turn off the lights, and so I remember going and complaining to them and saying, "Can you please turn off the lights?" And here I am, like a twelve-year-old, thirteen-year-old kid, going up and be like, "Arr, your your movie theater isn't good enough." But um, my favorite experience was actually just a few years ago, and maybe even last year, was seeing Happy Death Day to you. That was an incredible time. There is something about the energy in the movie theater that was unparalleled to any other experience that I've really had. Um, you know, it was just kind of younger, like our age, um, kids going to see it, and they were just having fun. And, you know, there was just such a amazing energy in there it was great so it's very funny that you just mentioned that i i have a large blu-ray collection at home i'm not maintaining it here but i did on amazon prime day i have not seen the happy death day movie so i recently just purchased happy death day to you and i was like i think that's right next to me over there so i'll be watching it soon i'll, I'll have to let you know what i think but i, I think yeah. blockbusters horror movies another one that i can go back to is fast and furious 6 it was a similar vibe packed theater everyone who was there wanted to see it and i think I think people will move forward and we'll be watching more non-blockbuster content at home. But I think blockbuster films, horror films, things where there's a lot of audience interest and there's a lot of passionate fans, I think those films will always have a place in a cinema. It's just hoping that the cinemas will be there when we're ready to start going up again that we have to worry about. Yeah, I really hope so too. And it seems pretty promising, you know, looking at... Um, AMC theater is opening up down here on Long Island specifically that I can think about, you know, I think they're just taking their time and making sure that everybody is going to be safe and that everybody can get the experience that, you know, we all want. Um, Best Adam Sandler movie, Spencer? I don't really think I have one. I really don't like comedy films. So I'd have to go with like Grown Ups only because I believe that was the last oh, one I've ever seen. On. Now, I'm going to, I mean, my, this isn't a great one, but um, just go with it. Nicole Kidman shows up randomly. Gotta love Jennifer Aniston. And, but unfortunately, that is, we're going to have to be done tonight with Director's Cut. Adam Sandler debate to continue for another time. Thanks to everybody for watching. And thank you to our guests, Jack Dalrymple and Lauren Cohen, for sitting down with us today. And be sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms at Director's Cut HU. But until next time, I'm your host, Spencer Fowler. And I'm Ryan Davies. And this, and this is has been, been Director's, Director's Cut. Cut. Good night.